Canadians everywhere are enjoying an extra slice of red and white cake in 2017 as the country marks its 150th birthday. It's time to celebrate with festivals and special events all year, all across the nation. Today's citizens revere July 1st, 1867 as an historic accomplishment. But as we draw around our tables for barbecues and fireworks displays, we've forgotten how ugly the Confederation debates really were and that the Maritimes didn't want Confederation to happen at all. By June 1864, the government of the province of Canada is defeated after only three months. It has been the third election in little over a year. John A. Macdonald is from Canada West and is joint premier of the province of Canada along with Etienne Pascal Tache and represents the Liberal Conservatives of Canada West, which is modern-day Ontario. Georges Etienne Cartier is the leader of the Pelletier Bleu, the French Conservatives in Canada East, which is modern-day Quebec. After 23 years, the Joint Legislative Assembly of the former Upper and Lower Canada is in ruins. What is now called Canada East and Canada West is deadlocked in a battle for political and cultural power. But by mid-June 1864, the political parties of Canada East and West agree to form a coalition government to explore the possibilities of a wider British North American federal arrangement. This pleases Britain, who is desperate for a cheap and efficient solution to a set of colonies it can no longer afford to defend. The United States encroaches. Even though it is still locked in a vicious civil war, it keeps its hungry eyes focused on the North. Perhaps a unified North would be harder to annex. The idea of a British North American Confederation had been discussed since the 1850s. But now the province of Canada was desperate for a solution to its failed marriage. The coalition agrees to propose a new contract, one that includes New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland, with Great Britain's blessing. Lieutenant Governor Arthur Hamilton Gordon and a delegation which includes New Brunswick leader Samuel Leonard Tilley welcomes Canadian politicians and journalists to New Brunswick in a tour of the maritime colonies during the summer of 1864. Samuel Leonard Tilley has been Premier of New Brunswick since 1861. A pharmacist by trade, he enters public life through the temperance movement and introduces prohibition legislation to New Brunswick twice, but can't make it stick. A diplomatic and well-liked person, Tilly is a strong supporter of the Intercolonial Railway and the Confederation principle. The Canadian delegation attended several friendly and optimistic meetings across the Maritimes during the summer of 1864, but one New Brunswick politician, in particular, is not invited. Born in Shediac, Albert James Smith is a successful lawyer from Dorchester who enters politics in 1852 when he wins a vacant seat for Westmoreland County. He is a tall, imposing man with dark hair and eyes and has a reputation for not backing down from a fight. Smith opposes Confederation and the Intercolonial Railway because he believes that New Brunswick's population and resources can't justify the increased taxation nor would New Brunswick wield any political power. Having experienced Smith's powers of persuasion in the Assembly firsthand, Tilly gathers a coalition of people, including political rivals, who could campaign for the Confederation project and carry it despite Smith's strong objections. Confederation isn't the only idea on the table. 
Maritime politicians are also discussing the possibility of maritime union, an idea which had been championed by New Brunswick's lieutenant governor. Arthur Hamilton Gordon is a priggish young aristocrat who arrives in New Brunswick as lieutenant governor in 1861. He enjoys the colony's natural beauty, but not its politicians, who he finds crude and ill-educated. He believes in maritime legislative union, one strong central government, nothing like the U.S.-style federalism which, in his mind, led to civil war a mere 78 years after the Revolution. Gordon arranges a maritime union conference for September 1864, and the Canadians ask permission to attend. The party-crashing Canadian delegation, which includes George Brown, Alexander Galt, Macdonald and Cartier, is given four days to present their case for confederation. Smith is not among the New Brunswick delegates chosen to attend, even though he was New Brunswick's leader of the opposition at the time. Everyone admits that union must take place sometime. I say now is the time. For twenty long years I have been dragging myself through the dreary waste of colonial politics. I thought there was no end, nothing worthy of ambition. But now I see something which is well worthy of all I have suffered. The delegation agrees to meet in Quebec in October to settle and ratify the proposals discussed in Charlottetown. Despite the uncertainty, Gordon's favorite idea of maritime union is dropped forever. While Tilly and his delegation is away at the Quebec conference debates in October, anti-confederation sentiment continues to grow at home. For New Brunswickers, it would not solve old problems but create new ones. In November 1864, Albert Smith makes his own views public in an open letter published in the St. John Evening Globe. He is outraged that New Brunswick citizens are not allowed to study the proposal before their leaders force the agreement upon them. Many of his constituents are French Catholics who are suspicious of the scheme. Instead of the high taxation required by the Intercolonial Railway, he supports the completion of the European and North American Railway from St. John to Maine, better known as Western Extension. Because of a treaty with the U.S. known as Reciprocity, New Brunswick enjoys a prosperous trading relationship with Maine rather than with Canada. And Smith objects to the idea of representation by population because New Brunswick's smaller size would leave her powerless. This union once completed, you are bound for all coming time. You cannot retrace your steps. There is no dissolving the compact. Your only relief will be in rebellion after the example of the United States. Further, what will be our influence in this new parliament? It is proposed to give us 15 and a house of 194 members. Our voice must be feeble, and I fear will often be unheard. Canada will without doubt be the controlling element, and practically we will be in a state of vassalage to her. You are proud to be a colony of Great Britain, but I think you are unwilling to become a dependency of Canada. New Brunswickers rally to Smith, and in January 1865, his debates carry 26 out of 41 seats in the Assembly. In the ensuing election, Tilly focuses his speeches on the profit and prosperity that will come to New Brunswick with Union, but he does not win the crowds. In one St. John Town Hall debate, the standing room only audience is so worked up that Smith must beg people to give Tilly a hearing. In March 1865, Smith wins the election on an anti Confederate platform. It was a shocking turn of events for MacDonald and his Canadian delegation. But Gordon and Tilly assure them that it's only a matter of time before Smith's plans fall apart. It's a fly in the ointment for MacDonald, but he remains confident.
Don't miss the anti-Confederate Albert the Smasher Part 2. There will be more dramatic letter writing, exhilarating boat rides, angry political confrontations, and a few Irishmen with guns. You don't want to miss that. So like and subscribe to Code Poet Media's channel. And consider supporting us on Patreon to help us make more maritime-focused content.